going to invite the children forward. Good morning. I spy with my little eye something that is white and red. Any guesses? A candy cane, uh, something in the room. Hmm? The flag. And you thought it was just the children's story, didn't you? Like we're all children. Now, you automatically knew how to play that, didn't you? As soon as I said I spy, you knew what I was playing, what, didn't you? Because you played it before. Yeah. It's a fun game, and it's a game that, that we play a lot, and it's an easy one for us to catch on to. Have you ever played a game called 20 Questions? Yeah. Do you know the rules of 20 Questions? No. So 20 Questions means that, so say you've got two people, and one person picks an object or a person or a thing or an animal or they pick something and then the other person has 20 questions to guess it and the key, and the key is is that all of your questions the answer has to be yes or no so say i picked gavin that was that was the the thing in my mind and you were going to have to guess what it was so your first question might be is it an animal? And I would go, no. Maybe sometimes. <laughs> and then your next question would be, is it a plant? And I would go, no. And you go, is it a person? And I go, yes. Yeah. For the sake of our game. And so you ask all those questions but you only get 20 questions and so you try and narrow it down as quickly as possible to try and figure out what we're what we're guessing what we're saying what we're thinking about and don't think it's just kids that play these games adults play these games too have you ever heard of the tv show jeopardy yeah so Jeopardy is a popular TV show, a game show, right? And I bet you there's some people here that watch Jeopardy. And the Jeopardy watchers are really faithful. And they yell at the TV. They yell out their answers. And so Jeopardy, right, is this contest. And they have, was it six categories? And they have these categories that come up. And then they have uh, questions underneath each category. And the contestant has to choose one of the categories and what level they want. And then the description comes up. And they have to answer, they have to say what that description is describing. So, see, there's even games for adults like that. Because it's, that's how we describe things, right? That's how we define things. That's how we figure out what things are or what they mean. By using other things to talk about them. Do you remember our children's hymn that we just sang? What was the, what was the opening line? In the bulb there is a flower. And there's a thing about the cocoon and the butterflies, right? Will soon be free. So it's using, but they're not talking really about flowers and butterflies, are they? When you really listen to the words, it's actually using things like bulbs and flowers and cocoons and butterflies. It's using it to describe the difference that Jesus makes in our life. Because this, the idea about Jesus and God, it's pretty big and hard to understand sometimes. But if we use things that we do understand, like how a butterfly transforms from a cocoon to a butterfly, it helps us understand how having Jesus in our life can help us change to be better and beautiful and creative and fun and all those good things, right? In our reading today from 1 Peter, the author of the, of the book talks about, he uses different words to describe Jesus and describe what our faith is, what it means to us, and how it works in us. Now, he says that Jesus is like spiritual milk to a newborn, to somebody who's new in the faith. Does that make any sense? Well, what's, what do they say when you, when you put your milk out at lunchtime and say, drink your milk? How do they convince you? What do they say? It'll make your bones strong. It's good for you. It's healthy for you. 
So think about spiritual milk. What do you think that means? Makes your soul strong, right? So as you learn more about Jesus, as you have more Jesus in your life, you'll be stronger. See, you guys can figure it out. You know how to read the Bible. There's one other thing that Peter says. He talks about Jesus being the cornerstone. What's that all about? Do you know what a cornerstone is? Yes. You were at the other service. <laughs> uh, cornerstone is when you're building something and you pick the best, most square, most level stone and you start from there. You put that in the corner and you build the rest of the building around it and on top of it. So if Jesus is the cornerstone, what do you think that means for us? Hmm? He starts us off, right? That if we use Jesus as our cornerstone, as our rock, as, as where we start everything from, then our building, our house, our, our bodies, our souls, it'll be stronger. We can build it higher and better and bigger. We use a lot of things to describe. We use pictures. We use things that we understand to describe Jesus and our faith. Because it helps us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. For all that he means to us. Thank you for helping us understand him better. Using things like butterflies, like cornerstones. Be with us in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. There's some sheets there. Our first reading this morning is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 7, and I'll actually be reading from verses 51 to 60. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in people in hearts and ears are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that receive the law as ordained by angels, yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he died. And our gospel reading is taken from, the go or rather our second reading is taken from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice, and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. 
But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May God bless these readings and our hearing of them. Amen. By the time we come to this part of 1 Peter, chapter 2, we have already heard five major exhortations, five things that Peter wants his readers to do that come in the very beginning of this letter. Believers are called to hope. They are called to be holy. They are called to be circumspect in their living. They are called to love one another. And then today, to desire that which will bring about growth. And after this, this list of exhortations, this list of, of actions to pursue, Peter tells us why. He takes these things, all of these things we should be doing and trying and working at, and he says we should be doing them because of who we believe we are. He turns to issues of identity. Who am I? Who are we? Knowing who we are, having that personal identity is transformative. It can change us. Melba Patilo Beals was a 17-year-old African-American girl living in Little Rock, Arkansas, when she and eight other students integrated into Central High School there in 1957. And segregationists, spurred on by the then Arkansas governor, defied the Supreme Court of the United States. They had made a ruling that said that all schools must integrate. And so they defied this ruling and they tried to halt the integration of their school. And these nine students, the African American students, known as the Little Rock Nine, they were forced to go to school, not forced to go to school, they chose to go to school to, to try and overturn this, to show their opposition to this continued segregation. With the protection of the army, and experienced a lot of adversity. There were crowds lining up, shouting at them, yelling racial slurs, throwing things at them. All in their quest for integration, for respect, for equality. Now, Melba Beals was motivated to continue this fight as a 17-year-old, this fight for integration. She was motivated by her wise grandmother who told her that we are God's ideas. And you must strive to be the best of what God made you to be. Grandma India gave her granddaughter the gift of identity. She affirmed that even as a young black woman in a country, in a, in a time when she was told that she was nothing, her grandmother told her that she was God's idea. You see, in our letter here, Peter seems intent on tra transforming, on changing his audience. Not simply by telling them what to do and expecting them to do it, but giving them the reasons behind those things. To change them by helping them understand who they are, who God is calling them to be. And he begins with this image of stones built into God's temple. And so in this word picture, in this, this metaphor, Jesus becomes the living stone that the believers embrace. The, the stone, the, the person in which they find their hope to go on. 
And Jesus is also the cornerstone that is rejected by many people, but who is of great value to God. And so the connecting point for Christian identity, for who we are, it comes in verse 5 in our reading. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. The follower is being made into the image of the master. You are God's idea. And together, together the followers are being built into God's temple to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And so all of these images coming back to back to back in some ways are very complex, but in other ways are very simple and very beautiful. Rather than seeing true worship as what happens in temples scattered to various gods throughout Asia Minor or at a temple in Jerusalem, Peter draws on this, these images of stones because this letter by Peter is written to the churches. And when I'm saying churches, I'm being generous because these churches were small little house churches. They were tiny groupings of people scattered across Turkey and Syria and other parts of the Middle East. They had fled persecution by the Romans. They had fled persecution by the Jews. And they were living sometimes in fear in these scattered cities and towns. And so they were feeling lost and lonely and persecuted and overwhelmed. And Peter wrote this letter to them to remind them of who they were. He's suggesting that it is acceptable to worship in these small little communities where sometimes only two or three were gathered. And that these stones, as they came together, were proclaiming the presence of God in themselves and in their communities. And Peter isn't finished yet with this metaphor as believers are made into the image of God, of God's idea of who they are. They also participate in the value that, Jesus, that God has placed on the cornerstone on Jesus himself. That even though Jesus was rejected, that was not the final word. Because we know, having just come through Easter, we know as Christians, when we say Jesus is risen, Christ is risen, the rejection was not the final word. And we share in that verdict from God. That even as these people in Asia Minor to whom this letter was written, even as they are feeling rejected, even as we sometimes feel rejected, we are not alone. Ultimately, God is with us. And whether we are new to the faith, whether we are longtime believers, we simply need to be grounded in the identity of who we are, that we are Christ, that we are God's idea, that we are children of God. That whatever our circumstances, we can draw hope from knowing who we are. And now changing directions completely in what I hope will make sense towards the end. I'm going to talk about the Beatles. Whatever you may think of the musical group, the Beatles, it's generally acknowledged that many, pop, many bands, especially popular bands, have never paid as much attention in their lyrics to people who are lonely or invisible in society. If we think about the lyrics of their songs, two of their songs carry particular poignancy in this regard. One haunting tune is titled Nowhere Man. The song talks about a nowhere man who sits in his nowhere land making his nowhere plans for nobody. But the song then asks, isn't he a little bit like you and me? 
Perhaps the, the, the most poignant song, though, and one of my personal favorites, is the song Eleanor Rigby. A song that, saint, that paints this sad picture of lonely people who live on the isolated margins of the world. Eleanor Rigby, we are told, is the caretaker of a small country church. Eleanor is the one who picks up the rice after the weddings have come and gone. Now the church's pastor is Father Mackenzie, a man who, it is said, writes the words to sermons that no one will hear because no one comes near. In the end, Eleanor Rigby dies in the church and is buried along with her name, and nobody came. The mournful chorus of this song asks, Look at all the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? And indeed, if we look around, if we look around in this congregation, if we look around at the community around us, if we look at the world, it is sadly very easy to find lonely and aimless and marginalized people, the one no one wants to talk to. Now, sometimes I don't mind eating out at a restaurant by myself or going to see a movie by myself. Sometimes it's fun to be by yourself and just watch people. But I have a choice. What if that table for one was all you can manage? and all that's ever going to be sitting with you? Or what if you flat out never go anywhere at all, you never leave the house, because your phone never rings with, visita with, with invitations, because you're perhaps physically unable to get out? What if your email or your snail mail never come with cards and invitations? Messages from friends or family asking how you're doing or suggesting that perhaps we get together next weekend. What if you really and truly felt alone and cut off all the time? And there are people like that everywhere. Have you ever felt alone in a crowd? Have you ever had that, that brief stab of loneliness? Some people live with that 24 hours a day. In this lectionary passage from 1 Peter, the author writes, Once you were no people. Now, some translations, including our own this morning, which I read, they translate this line as, Once you were not a people. But in the original Greek, all it has is the negative word, no. So if you translate it literally, it would say, once you were a no people. Once you were nobody. You were a nowhere man or a nowhere woman. You were marginalized. You were isolated. You were ignored by the world. You were off floating on the fringes of society. No people. That, Peter tells his readers, is who they had once been. Nobodies, belonging to nobody in particular, going nowhere special in life, no people. And we can hear the aching sadness in that. If you can, if you can hear that, then perhaps you can also hear the lyrical, lilting nature of this passage, that, hear it in a way that will hit home. If you can sense the longing behind what Peter is saying, then you will also sense the invitation, the hope that is present here in these words. That the invitation of Christ to be part of something larger, that you were created in God's image, that you are God's idea, that you were meant to be part of the body of Christ, that you are invited to the table to never eat alone. This is what Peter is trying to tell them. Jesus himself was an outsider from Galilee, 
Do you remember the saying in the Bible, nothing ever good comes from Nazareth? The Galileans were a marginalized people. Jesus was poor. He worked with his hands. He was not formally educated. He traveled around with a small band of followers. He was chased out of his hometown. Probably rejected by some of his family, at least early on in his ministry. That's just my crazy brother. And yet Jesus did not finish that way. Rejected by society, rejected by the people, he didn't finish there. He becomes the living stone, the living cornerstone. Once you were a no people, Peter says, and we know what that's like. Once you were a no people, but now you are a people of God. And just like Melba's grandmother, who reminded Melba that she was God's idea, the gospel tells us that this is possible, that it happens all the time, that nobodies become somebodies, that the lost and the isolated get found, they get included, they become something grand, they are new, they are called to something by God. That the once lonely, the no people, who had cried themselves to sleep at night or who had drifted off to sleep with the front of the flickering television because they had nothing else to do. We are all invited. We are all welcomed. We are all God's idea. That every time we sob in loneliness, every time we stifle a cry, every time we see a happy family passing us on the street and we go and we wonder why. It's a cry of, Lord, have mercy, whether we know it or not. Once you had not received mercy, Peter says, but now, now you have. For all the lonely people who know deep down that being lonely is not the way God wanted things to be, for all such as this, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. The rejected one, that for those who are no people, those who cry for mercy, those who have not yet been found, they are the very ones that Christ will lift up first. That we are God's idea. We matter. And as I give apologies to the Beatles, all the lonely people, where do they all come from? Our culture creates them. God saves them. Amen.